Welcome to the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall. I'm Kim McClary, President and CEO, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to today's program. For all our viewers, thank you for your ongoing support and viewership that has sustained us during this, these very challenging times. We will continue to bring you these strong lineups of programs in a live stream format, and we hope to return to in-person programs as well as soon as it's safe to do so. For those of you who would like to submit questions to our speaker and moderator, there's a control panel on the right-hand side of your screen where you can type in your questions. Jessica Deganzik, our Vice President of Events, will be managing your questions during the Q&A portion of today's program, which will start in about 30 minutes. It is now my great pleasure to welcome you to today's program, Opportunities and Challenges in U.S. Foreign Policy, with Michelle Flournoy, co-founder and managing partner of West Exec Advisors. She also served as the Undersecretary for Defense for Policy. Our moderator, Robert Abernathy, is chairman of American Standard Development, and we also value him so much as a board member of the World Affairs Council Town Hall. Bob and Ms. Florna, we are so happy to have you here today. Bob, let me turn this over to you because I we want every minute focused on this conversation. Thank you. Kim, thank you very much for those words. You know, we're very fortunate to have you as our president. For those of us who have are members of Los Angeles World Affairs Council Town Hall and who have, particularly those who've been members for many, many years, value your leadership and the work you've done this year in promoting the council and moving us forward very much. Um, thank you. Michelle, well, welcome. We're delighted to have you here with us in the meeting with the council this morning. We wish it would have been in person, but we're virtually meeting now in accordance with what we need to do to contain COVID. Um, you know, you've ha held very prestigious positions with the Defense Department. You were Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense uh, under President Clinton. Uh, for, that was for strategy. And later under the Obama administration, you became Under Secretary of Defense for Policy. In that role, you were the principal advisor to the, to the Secretary of Defense in the formation of national security policy and the oversight of both military plans and of operations and in the work of the National Security Council. Those are both lofty jobs and I think at the time you were the highest ranking woman in the Department of Defense. But you know, I wanna go back because really, uh, you're a Los Angelino. Your roots are here with us. We're the Los Angeles World Council. And, and uh, you know, you grew up here and you're part of us and we value the common heritage we have. I think uh, you attended the Beverly Hills uh, uh, High School. You grew up in a home in Beverly Hills that you were immersed in your uh, junior high school years in providing insight and thoughts and examples that were incorporated into I Love Lucy and into The Odd Couple. And I'm sure we're, we're a material influencer of the content that was on both those shows. Unfortunately, uh, they were principally uh, created by your, your dad and your dad died of a heart attack when I think you were 14, must have been maybe freshman year in, in high school. How did you cope with that uh, tragedy in your life? How did it affect you and how did you recover from it? Wow, well, first of all, it is wonderful to be with the LA Council. It does feel a little bit like coming home. Um, so uh, yeah, my dad was a cinematography director uh, for the Lucy Show and The Odd Couple. And so, um, I'm not sure how much impact I had on the content, but I was a, a frequent watcher of the filming and, and sometimes uh, gave him my, my two cents um, as a young child. Um, 
But you know, the loss of my dad, I think it was probably the a truly earth shattering kind of experience at the time. It was, we were very close. He was a wonderful father. Um, and um, I think for me though, eventually it translated in a, into a source of motivation that his life had been cut short. And so I needed to make sure that my life was of greater value or my that I was making more of a difference in the world. I was sort of living for two, if you will. Um, and I actually, that was the theme of my college essay um, of how that um, trauma had sort of turned into a source of motivation for me um, going as a young person. When you were a young person, you uh, wanted to be an architect. And you know, I think maybe I should be looking up and down Wilshire Boulevard at buildings that you designed or downtown LA at buildings that came out of your creative uh, juices. But that didn't happen. You evidently uh, were trying to become a student at St. Louis Obispo in, in uh, Cal Poly there uh, in architecture. Uh, tell us about what your original desires were to be an architect and how all that changed. Well, first of all, I have to compliment you on your research, <laughs> because very rarely do people come up with the biographical details of my teens. But anyway, um, so I was very fortunate, you know, even though we lived in a, a sort of rent control apartment after my parents' divorce and then my father's passing, um, I had the access to one of the best public schools in the nation, Beverly Hills High, and they had a full up engineering and architecture department and I took every single class in there. I competed at the state fair. I just loved design. I loved the uh, creativity of it, the exactness of the, the math of it, the, uh, um, the whole thing. And so I thought, I want to be an architect. I have found what I want to do at age 16. And at the time I had a very wise um, high school counselor. Um, who said, well, maybe maybe that's your passion, maybe that will turn into your career, but why don't we give it a little time, why don't we test the waters on some other things? And so the first thing is she encouraged me to apply for a scholarship that would enable me to be an exchange student. And I had a chance to spend a summer in Belgium at age 16, and that sort of opened my eyes to the big wide world out there and suddenly got me very interested in things international. And the second thing she said is, look, if you want to be an architect, you're going to have to do a graduate degree. Why don't you go to a liberal arts school, get the full range of things that you can explore. And if after all that exploration, you still want to be an architect, great. And so she encouraged me to apply to a number of liberal arts schools. I ended up going to Harvard. I did take the, the, the design course that my freshman year but by the end of senior year, I shifted gears to be very focused on international relations. And then you went to England, right? Yes. In Oxford, to uh, uh, Balliol. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us about that experience. Well, I had a wonderful mentor at, at Harvard who said, if you're going to study international relations at some point, you have to understand how the rest of the world sees the United States. And so he would he encouraged me to pursue my graduate work um, in a non-US context. And there again, I needed the scholarship money. I applied for some scholarships. One of them came through. I ended up spending two wonderful years in Oxford doing my master's degree there. And uh, when I wasn't writing my thesis, I, I majored in rowing uh, and you know, took up a lifelong uh, passion for, for rowing as well. Well, that, that's very interesting. I didn't know that. We'll come back to the rowing uh, yeah. in the context of a book uh, your husband has written, which I'm sure you had a big hand in. But uh, for the meantime, let me just say, I think I expect this uh, uh, Thursday, uh, Tony Blinken and Jake Sullivan to in fact, go over to uh, China and to uh, talk, talk to their counterparts there. But, um, you know, before going there, uh, there's the quad. Uh, tell us about the quad, uh, why you think they may be contacting the quad, what objective 
they have in, in talking to the three others in the US in the Quad in preparation for that China meeting, either what you think they'll be doing or what you think they ought to be doing or both if they're different. Uh, and then what you think their objectives are and then ought to be if you think they're different in their meetings in their with their counterparts in China. Sure. So let me start with the Quad. Uh, the Quad consists of the United States, Japan, Australia, and India, uh, four democracies who have shared values and interests around democracy and, and human rights and, and so forth, and, and the broader Indo-Pacific. And the Quad was actually, uh, I think it may have had its first meeting in the Bush administration, but it certainly continued to develop in the Obama administration. And then last week on Friday, you had the first time the four leaders had met at that level virtually um, to talk about common interests. And so the Quad is really um, sort of operationalizing a, a basic uh, principle of the Biden administration approach to China, which is the best approach to China is to uh, go approach them arm in arm with our allies and partners who have shared interests and values um, and will be much more stronger in doing that, much more effective. And so I think these, what you see is the administration making some investments in trying to figure out what can the you know these four countries, leading democracies in the region, do together to have positive impact on the region, whether it's on you know vaccine distribution, pandemic prevention, um, climate uh, addressing climate change, and so forth. But also, how do we shore up the rules-based order in the Indo-Pacific? How do we push back against China when it's it, you know it, it's assertive behavior sort of uh, bends or breaks those rules? And so it really is a forum for collaboration among the, the largest uh, uh, democracies in the region. And I think it has a huge amount of, of potential. Um, so FET now move forward to what we're gonna see this week, the so-called Alaska summit, where this is really sort of a table setting su summit for having two senior Chinese officials, the two, um, you know, the national security advisor, Jake mm -hmm. Sullivan and secretary of state, Tony Blinken, sit down with their Chinese counterparts to really kind of talk about the state of play and the relationship um, and how we want to move forward. I don't expect them to come to any big substantive agreements. It's more of a agenda setting meeting, uh, more of a how do we want to engage. One of the things that Vice President Biden was used to when he was in office with President Obama was we had a very regular high level multi-dimensional strategic dialogue with China, where we, we talked about our differences, we talked about areas of cooperation, we talked about areas where we had concerns, um, but it wasn't, it was uh, covering everything from econo uh, economics to technology to defense to diplomacy, et cetera. So I think what they're gonna be talking about is how do we wanna move forward with the relationship? How do we wanna engage each other on the full range of issues? So I think it's more of a planning session, if you will, than anything else? Well, many people in the United States um, see relationships with China as a zero-sum game. And politically, you hear the call for rhetoric that uh, really is trying to beat down China, where those members of the World Affairs Council in Los Angeles and people like yourself realize that the areas for cooper cooperation with China are huge, that uh, much of what we do is a win-win situation, or at least could do is a win-win situation as po opposed to a zero-sum game. But it's done in a political environment that is largely as the concept of the relationship of one as a zero-sum game. How does the president go about managing the process of trying for those co cooperative results in an environment that views it the way I've just described. Yeah, no, I, I mean, it's challenging because it's not black or white. It's, we, it's a relationship that is very complex, multidimensional. It has elements of competition to be sure, but it also has really important elements of cooperation. 
Um, and so I think, you know, what I'm hearing from people in the administration, even early in this early stage is, number one, we need to invest in the drivers of American competitiveness here at home, uh, science and technology, research and development, 21st century uh, infrastructure like broadband, uh, access to higher education, smart immigration policy that, that gets the best and brightest from around the world to come and actually stay in America and build their businesses and make their contributions here. So we have to start by shoring up our own foundations as we come out of COVID, as we come out of this economic trough. Secondly, we've mentioned um, by, with, and through allies and partners. We are stronger if we can push back on China's uh, you know, un, uh, unhelpful behavior or problematic behavior um, you know, when we're in league with others. Um, but third, we also have to I, you know, engage China um, where we can on the cooperative agenda. You know, we've got to learn some lessons together about how do we prevent the next pandemic and put ourselves in a stronger position to do that. How do we address climate change? We will fail on climate if China's not on board uh, and making meaningful changes. How do we address nonproliferation and problems like North Korea? So this has to be a multifaceted agenda. And um, it's challenging politically because that's a lot of shades of gray. Um, but I think that is what the Biden administration is striving for. And where we do compete, we have to identify very clearly what are those key areas where we need to both promote our own success, but also constrain China. And on those, you know, they talk about smaller gardens, higher walls. So identify those key technology areas and then fence them in, protect what we need to protect, but don't use a sledgehammer on the relationship, use a scalpel, right? To carve those areas out where we need to actually have real constraints because of national security. There is a new Chinese program that involves fusion. I don't believe it is trying to make energy out of how to work with hydrogen molecules. Uh, would you talk to us about uh, their their blending, their uh, fusion of military and civilian yeah. arenas? So in the Chinese system, you know, the state really does have, you know, authoritarian control. And so when you have a technological development in their equivalent of Silicon Valley, um, sort of on the commercial side, whether it's in a state-owned enterprise or a private company in China, and that technology has a military application, the Chinese government is very comfortable directing that that technology be shared with um, the military to advance their capability. And so um, if they, they end up having a much tighter um, integration between their commercial tech sector and their military. Um, here uh, you know, in the US, it's quite a different situation where <clears throat> You have most of Silicon Valley, Austin, Route 128, focused on the commercial sector. There are some companies that are interested in national security and try to be dual use and offer the military and the intelligence community their products and offerings as well. But we are still cracking the code on how to bridge the gap and enable those companies to be successful in working with the national security community. So just because, in contrast to the Chinese case, just because we have the cutting edge in a commercial technology in the United States does not necessarily mean that our military or our national security community will be able to avail themselves of that advantage. And so we have to work harder to bridge that gap um, because we're in a free market system. Another traditional competitor has been Russia. They're in a much different category in competitors with us. Sort of describe what's important about our relationship with Russia and how that differs from China. So I think of Russia um, less as an outright competitor and more as a potential spoiler. You know, by any objective measure, they are a country that is in decline relative to where they were as the Soviet Union. They're economically, demographically, um, in, in, in terms of political influence around the world. Um, but Putin is very skilled at playing a weak hand very well. He's 
very, he doesn't hesitate to use the, what I call the KGB playbook. So disinformation, propaganda, assassination and poisoning of political opposition leaders, as we've just seen, um, meddling in democracies to try to weaken those systems. His biggest fear is true democracy coming to Russia. So the more he can, can discredit democracy, make us look like we're in chaos, um, the safer he feels. Um, and so he is going to be a source of, um, of kind of poking us in the eye, um, whether it's major espionage, cyber espionage a la solar winds, whether it's other cyber attacks, whether it's showing up in Syria to now, you know, any kind of solution Syria has to go through Putin as the sort of arbiter of, of negotiations. I mean, he will just um, be a thorn in our side. Now, Russia still has a nuclear arsenal. I was very, it's very, that is a danger to us. We, I was very pleased to see the Biden administration extend the life of the New START Treaty by five years. Um, that's a good thing for strategic stability. So we have to keep an eye on Russia. We have to invest in deterring Russia with our allies at NATO. Um, but they're not a competitor in the same sense that China is, not, not by a long shot. We have uh, seen the increase of harm, potential harm from cyber. Uh, back a few years ago, uh, you know, we as a country were quite successful in creating software that was very sophisticated, that got in very quietly into computers in Iran that controlled centrifuges and got in in such a way that it created damage that was uh, hard to detect what the cause of the damage came from. Uh, it, it later became pretty well public knowledge when it was publicized. We have heard a lot about the Chinese and the Russians and others uh, trying to break into our computer systems in the United States. So far, we don't have, at least in the public arena, any knowledge of their succeeding or even trying to do the sorts of things that happened in the Iran centrifuge computers. Yet, we do know that most of our transportation, uh, water delivery systems, electric generating systems, et cetera, are con controlled by computers on the internet. How much, when you worry about the Pentagon, the defense establishment, um, and where money ought to be put, is, is you know, the old days under McNamara, uh, Hitch, and Tobin, Anthony, um, you budgeted for military uh, hardware and systems that took five to 10 years to develop. They were ships and they were aircraft and there were the ability to put uh, soldiers in the field on the ground to do the defense work. Um, today, there's still a lot of that, but we've shifted. And you expressed worries about artificial intelligence and about things in that arena. How does all of that impact on both what we worry about uh, Russia doing and also how we ought to be reorienting uh, defense uh, acquisition and money being spent? And it's a big arena, but tell us a little bit about your, your thoughts there. Well, I, I think actually neither Moscow nor Beijing wants to get into a direct confrontation or conflict with the United States. We all recognize that all three are nuclear powers. We recognize the risk of escalation. I don't think anybody sees a war as in their interests. Um, and so what you see is from Russia and even uh, in terms of China, asymmetric approaches. Russia's primary instrument for poking at us uh, is the use of cyber and uh, by extension disinformation. They have you know, hundreds if not thousands of hackers both officially inside the, US, uh, inside the Russian government, either in the intelligence service or the GRU, 
um, or sort of criminal um, elements that they recruit uh, to do their cyber hacking for them. Uh, I had a cyber expert describe how uh, Russian government officials will attend the trials of cyber people being prosecuted for cyber crime and at the end say, look, you can either go to jail now or you can come and work for us. So they literally recruit cyber criminals to come in and do the government's bidding in this sort of hybrid model. So there is definitely a risk of espionage in terms of, but there's also, as you said, you know, 90 plus percent of our critical infrastructure in the United States, including most of the electrical grid, is um, owned and operated by the private sector. And so the, we know the Russians have certainly surveyed um, many parts of our critical infrastructure and have implanted uh, malware that they haven't turned on, but they could turn on in the future to create a real problem for us. Um, if you look at Chinese doctrine, they talk about system destruction warfare, which means basically targeting through cyber and other means our ability to, uh, to see um, from space, our ability to communicate, our ability to move forces and navigate and target. And so the theory is if you can create enough chaos in these networks, the U.S. forces won't actually be able to show up to aid their allies or to deter aggression. And so I think we have to spend a lot more of our mental bandwidth thinking through our own asymmetric response to those approaches and to invest. Uh, we're a little bit, we're, we're not more than a little bit, we are over-invested in legacy hardware and we're under-invested in some of these key emerging technologies, be it cyber, be it AI, um, being at um, autonomy that allows you to network unmanned and manned systems. Um, these are areas that are going to make the real difference in the future as to whether we keep our edge and most importantly, whether we can deter conflict in the first place. Can we convince Russia and China that aggression won't be successful? So why try? Can we convince them that even if they could do it, it would be too costly because of our response? And so they don't. Deterrence is going to be the name of the game in, with both Russia and China, and thinking asymmetrically about how to do that most effectively will be important. You've done a lot of thinking about national security over the, over the years, a whole lot. Um, when you think about national security, what do you think about our objectives? What ought they to be, and what framework do you put that thinking in and how wide or broad is that framework? What does it include? I think of very fundamental terms that are, you know, in our founding documents, um, the, the prosperity, the security, the well-being of the American people and our way of life. If you can't tie something to those things, it's not about national security. I do think that in this day and age, you know, in, as we come out of a pandemic, of course we have to think about pandemic prevention as a national security issue going forward. As we think about climate change, it's not just an environmental catastrophe with lots of economic impact, it's going to be a national security issue if it causes, you know, conflict or greater competition, if not conflict over scarce resources like water and arable land, if it causes mass migrations of people, if it puts our military facilities around the world on the coasts underwater uh, and, you know, and creates a huge amount of challenge for our forces. You know, this is a national security issue for many number of dimensions. Um, so we have to broaden our frame when, beyond traditional state-based threats. Um, just as we had to broaden our frame after 9-11 to think about non-state actors and their, the threats that they pose. Um, one of the areas of the world that has been a trouble area for us for decades is the, is the Middle East. What do you think our role ought to be there? What do you think our long-term objectives ought to be involving Iran, the nuclear deal there, Afghanistan, uh, Israel, the West Bank, energy dependence? How do you size it all up and, and put it? Yeah. 
No, I, you know, I, I do think the U.S. has interests in the Middle East. We care about, even though we have greater energy independence and we're less dependent on military, uh, mil Middle East sources of energy today, we do care about the stability of the global market um, and so forth. We care about the energy supplies for our allies. Um, we care, we very much care about deterring a revolutionary regime in Iran from starting conflict or for destabilizing other regimes. We care about keeping uh, terrorism that could come home to American shores in check. Um, so we do have interest there. But I think after 20 years of counterterrorism and counter in, uh, insurgency operations, we are overinvested in the Middle East militarily. Um, and I think the Pentagon has announced a global posture review. I expect that they will be asking the question of how do we safeguard our interests and deter actors like Iran uh, and, and, you know, and, and keep things at a manageable level of risk, but do it with you know, fewer forces and less of a footprint than we have there today so that we can focus more on deterring great power conflict, whether it's vis-a-vis -vis China um, uh, in particular, or in some cases, Russia. But I think you're gonna see a fundamental review and some creative thinking about how we safeguard our interests, but with less investment so that we have more mind share and more resources for other parts of the world that may pose more direct threats to our well-being. How do we move forward and try to get Iran um, back at the negotiating table, a complicated situation? We walked out of a treaty. Uh, our allies stayed in it. Yeah. Um, and now we're wanting to go back, but we also have additional things that weren't covered in that treaty that we want Iran to do. What order do we take them in and how do we uh, actually achieve workable results uh, looking at the world also from their points of view. Yeah, this is a bit of a dance that we're in right now with uh, Iran. I do think that both sides want to go back to the JCPOA, the original agreement as a starting point. Um, the question, and the question is both how to get there and then what happens next. So the how to get there, Iran is saying, well, why don't you just lift all the sanctions and then we'll come back into compliance. The administration is saying, well, show us some that show us that you're coming back to a, a compliance and then we can think about, you know, um, uh, lifting the nuclear related sanctions. Um, but neither side wants to take the first step. You have a complicating factor that um, the Biden administration on its right flank has some very hard line views in Congress. They're going to watch them like a hawk, and they don't want the Biden administration to make any big concessions to Iran. And um, for Iran's part, they've got a presidential election coming up in June, and so their politics are at a delicate moment. And Rouhani, who has been a big champion of this effort, is you know you know obviously his his time is coming uh, to an end as in the leadership. So. Then you also have the question of what happens after you come back to the JCPOA. So I think Iran would be like, okay, then we're done. And the US is going to say, well, wait a minute, all this time has passed. Of course, we have to extend the duration of the agreement so it doesn't sunset you know, immediately. And oh, by the way, we have some other issues to discuss. We are concerned about the ballistic missile threats that you pose to others in the region. We're concerned about their, your use of proxies, whether it's Hezbollah in Lebanon to constantly uh, harass Israel, whether it is the Houthis in Yemen who are actively using, uh, you know, engaged in a civil war and using um, rockets and missiles against Gulf states, you know, both the uh, Saudis and the Emiratis. Um, so there, this is challenging. I, you, you know, go back to what you first mentioned. I think we should be leveraging the other countries that were at the table um, for the JCPOA, the EU, uh, Russia, China, to try to prevail upon Iran to actually come back to the table in good faith, that we will come back to the table in good faith, and we need to negotiate some of these things out. Um, it's very hard to do this through, you know, battling, you know, statements in the press. 
it's not going to work very well. In December 2011, you were Leon Panetta's a chief advisor when he was Secretary of, of Defense. And you decided that you were going to step down from that job to be able to spend uh, more time with your family, your three kids, and your husband. Um, the family produced the book, People Factor, Strengthening America by Investing in Public Service. And I just know that uh, you know many people talk but don't walk. But in your case, at least the family has been involved in defense, the Navy, the Import-Export Bank, the White House, the Treasury, Commerce, uh, <laughs> Veterans Administration, and, and, and on and on it goes. So you've served collectively very, very well, America and all of us, and we appreciate that um, very much. Um, but I wanted to ask, you, ask. You, were, you, were, you were urging your kids to follow in your footsteps and to also be public service servants, but I noticed that you know you talked about rowing. You've got uh, one son, Alec, who's a pretty good rower, and therefore that is a following your steps. Yeah. He went into the the Naval Academy. I assume he's graduated now, which followed the long naval career of Scott, your husband. And uh, I you know I don't know uh, about uh, Aiden. I guess just graduated from Ball Whitman High. And is interested in, in gaming. And you know, the Department of Defense does an awful lot of gaming uh, with RAND, without RAND, you're in the gaming. And, uh, and you're, you're Victoria, um, uh, I think she's about to graduate from the University of Wisconsin in Madison. And I don't know whether you're set, setting her in the direction of public service or not. But talk to us a little bit about your family and the integration of. Uh, of a, a very successful career with the, what appears to be a very successful family development that you succeeded in and and uh, how you view trying to balance uh, and as, as, as a parent, you balance the, the responsibilities at home with those in your, in your public arena in your life, business life. Well, thanks for the uh, question. Like I said, I just have to ha hats off to whoever your researcher is who's taking up all these details. But no, I mean, I think, you know, my husband who had served in all those wonderful places you listed, um, you know, I think we both feel very strongly about um, public, some kind of public service or some kind of service that if you're privileged enough to get access to a great education, and you know, uh, and other opportunities that there's sort of a you owe society something, you owe of uh, your country something. And we've never dictated what that should be for our kids. We just encourage them to think along those lines. And so, as you mentioned, my eldest graduated from the Naval Academy a year and a half ago. He's now in training as a young ensign in the Navy, and we're very, very proud of him. Uh, my daughter's about to graduate. She's decided she wants to be a doctor. And so she's fitting up, finishing up her pre-med education and will hopefully go to medical school. And then my, my youngest is, uh, we'll see whether it's gaming, wildlife contribution, uh, con conservation, doing his own stint in the Navy or another military service. We'll see. He's, uh, he's still young and has lots of different ideas. Um, but we're very proud of them all for thinking about that question of how do I make a difference and how do I, you know, serve some higher purpose in my career at some, you know, at some point in my my career. In terms of the balance, you know, when you are in some of these intense jobs in government, frankly, there is no balance. Um, and what you have to hope for is, you know, choosing a boss that will work with you to enable you to 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 work it on the margins, um, and uh, really recruiting, you know, it takes a village, you know, recruiting others to help. We, um, you know, whether it's family members or um, help uh, that you that you find elsewhere, I, I joke, and it's true, I still feel like I am paying back 
carpooling IOUs from the, my period of government service 10 years ago, because uh, my kids were shuttled around by so many other parents during that time. Um, so I, I, I applaud people who try to manage it. Um, but you do, you know, you ask a lot of your family during those periods, and hopefully there are other periods where you can give it back or reinvest. My last question. Um, you sat down for lunch one day with uh, seven other women, presumably the total that were then uh, in working at the Pentagon. A little bit worried about what the reaction might be of uh, people seeing uh, all the small group of women th together. Um, today, uh, the Pentagon situation, as far as gender diversity, is very much different. Um, it's uh, different in many ways, diversity-wise. Uh, talk to us a little bit about the importance, the value of diversity in the Pentagon and in general in corporate decision making about having a diverse workforce and having a diverse leadership that guides the organization. So I think there are a number of arguments for really embracing diversity, um, not only in, the na in national security, but more broadly in our society. One is that, you know, particularly in government, you know, we are a democracy and you want to see people, the cadre, the cohort that's in public service look something like America. Um, and from just a, I think from a values-based perspective, that is an ideal that we should have as democracy, as a democracy. Um, you know, a cadre that really leverages the full range of talent, and lived experience that's available to us in the United States of America, which is extraordinary. Um, I think the second reason is more derived from the, you know, both the business literature on this topic, but also my own experience, you know, sitting in the situation room and listening while the president was trying to make a tough decision. When you have more diverse opinions and perspectives and people with different backgrounds and experiences, not just ethnically or gender, but like full lived experience, um, you, uh, you get different perspectives, you get orthogonal views, you, you get a richer exploration of the decision space. And what the literature, you know, shows, the business literature is that uh, organizations with more diverse leadership teams and boards make better decisions and actually perform better in terms of their bottom lines. So um, I certainly saw it in government, you know, as a guard against groupthink to have that diversity of perspectives around the table. Um, I think that in the national security cadre, we're making progress, particularly on gender, uh, on the civilian side. Um, you know, I, I talked about those eight women back in the Clinton administration that were sort of noticeable because it was all eight of us at one table and everybody's like, oh my God, gosh, you know, what are they talking about? Now you could fill that whole executive dining room with women. Um, so we've come a long way. We aren't where we need to be. Um, and we certainly aren't where we need to be in terms of other forms of diversity, nor are we where we need to be in terms of the DOD culture as evidenced by the persistent problem of sexual harassment and assault. So progress, some progress, but a lot more that needs to be made until we are really operating at our best. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, Jessica, I think we'll now go to member questions. Great, thank you so much. Um, this first question comes from a fellow Norman. So she says, hi, Michelle, go Normans. And I believe the career counselor was Pat Henning. President Biden has mentioned the need for building up the economies of and job opportunities in Mexico and Central American countries to reduce the need for people to flee those areas. Do you see a possibility to greatly emphasize building up manufacturing there, not only to build up those economies, but to reduce our reliance on China as a major player in the supply chain and manufacturing? Actually, the I do remember Pat Henning, but the counselor was Patsy Carter, just for the record. So <laughs> um, in terms of, so I do think that um, we have an interest in certainly addressing some of the root causes that are 
creating the mass immigrate, you know, migration towards our southern borders, um, and most particularly in places like Honduras and Guatemala, El Salvador. Um, but also, you know, we have an incredible uh, relationship with both Canada and and Mexico and other states in in the Western Hemisphere. I do think that one of the answers to um, diversifying our supply chain in areas where we're not comfortable relying, you know, primarily or heavily on China, whether it's in national security related items, whether it's in key technology areas where we want to keep a competitive edge, whether it's in pharmaceuticals and PPE, as we've just learned their importance in the pandemic. All of those are areas where we can think about reshoring, not just to the United States, but to other trusted regional partners, um, where we uh, can, um, you know, if the economies were, if the economics of the decisions work, where we could potentially build more robust uh, supply chains and also help our neighbors develop their economies in ways that, again, might reduce some of the immigration pressure that we've been feeling. Thank you. What can the U.S. do about the tragic situation in Myanmar with a military that doesn't have qualms about killing its own civilians? Yeah, this is a really hard one, and we've seen this movie before. I think we have to impose heavy sanctions, not just U.S., but internationally. Heavy sanctions, heavy diplomatic pressure, um, and including from the states on which Myanmar's most dependent, so China, for example, to really um, increase the costs of this behavior um, to the regime. Uh, so it is, it is a, I think, a um, really important um, element, um, an emphasis on democracy and human rights in the, Biden, the new administration's approach. But most of the, the leverage we have is actually international. So we got to build a coalition to really put pressure on the regime to modify, uh, moderate its behavior. You mentioned the Quad support for human rights, but India has a ways to go in this area. How does this impact India's position in the Quad? So I, mean, I think one of the things about the Quad that's a strength is, you know, it is a, a gathering of strong allies and uh, whether it's bilateral or in that group, we I think we're able to have pretty frank discussions um, about uh, treatment of minorities, uh, human rights, and so forth. And I expect that most of that's happening more in a bilateral context rather than in the group, but it's certainly a key theme, and it's one we shouldn't shy away from with any of our allies or partners. That's part of what it means to be an ally. <laughs> we can have those conversations. And I, I will tell you, that I know of several occasions where during the Trump administration, the Indians raised some very frank concerns with the Trump administration about its behavior in certain areas. So again, that's a sign of a healthy alliance in my view, and I think that should be a topic of conversation between us. What is currently being done to address the egregious violations of religious freedoms in Russia? Um, that's a good question. I don't have a very in-depth uh, answer. Um, I do know, again, this is uh, an area where the U.S. regularly demarches Russia. I know there's a lot of concern about this on the Hill and some discussion of, you know, adding additional sanctions uh, to Russia. Um, but again, I think to be most effective, We've got to get our European allies and others who uh, trade with Russia, um, who interact with Russia, to be pushing on this topic as well. Unfortunately, I am not very hopeful on this question, um, given how uh, Putin uh, has, you know, behaves, and given that even in the face of unprecedented protests, you know, how firmly his grip on power seems to be holding. Uh, is it true that China is sitting on a $4 trillion surplus? Do they have any national debt at all? Um, again, I'm not an economist, but China certainly has debt. Um, so, I mean, and, and in some way, in some areas, I think 
there's a lot of um, skepticism among Western economists about the strength of their, particularly their stock market and their companies, given the level of debt that they have undertaken to sort of pump money into their economy to try to create more of a consumer economy than has existed in the past. So, um, you know, she keeps talking about the importance of raising domestic demand and making China more competitively internationally, um, but they definitely have a, a pretty large debt overhang from what I understand. Again, I would, I would love to see you ask that question of a, you know, a, a economics PhD or someone who makes their business watching the uh, Chinese uh, financial markets and, and, and debt structure and such. But my impression is that no, they, have a, they actually have a problem in that regard that they're going to have to address over time as their economy evolves. Right. Well, I will tuck it away. So when I have that next next economist, I can ask them. Uh, this questioner says, the Bill Gates book on climate change identifies China as creating three times the CO2 as the US, plus building $59 billion in new coal plants. How can we turn them around? Yeah, I think we, um, this is, again has to be a source of um, both uh, carrots and sticks internationally. You know, the international community has to press China to to increase its ambitions in terms of uh, reducing its carbon emissions. Um, one of the really interesting sort of critical decision points that will be coming up is, you know, as we develop new green technologies, whether it's carbon capture technologies or alternatives to coal or what have you, the question of does the United States or in Europe, do we keep those, you know, as our proprietary technologies because we want to make money off exporting them? Or do we share them with China in order to in, increase their ability to actually get after this problem um, for the sake of all of us? That is going to be a really interesting thing to watch in the future because I don't think China has the wherewithal to do it alone. They are going to need international, I don't mean my monetary assistance, but technology assistance um, to fundamentally change the energy foundation of their economy and to adopt more green technologies. Okay. With over a billion increasingly educated people, is it not inevitable that China becomes the world's greatest power, whether we like it or not? How do you see this developing? And when will East Asia move from the US sphere of influence to the Chinese sphere? Well, I think that China will be a great power. Um, uh, I think whether they become the greatest power depends on a number of things, only a few of which are in our control. The, the main thing that's in our control is how much do we invest in the drivers of our own competitiveness? Um, so that we, we can you know, keep our edge and keep it key areas. But far more in fundamental will be the demographic change uh, in China. China is aging very, very quickly because it, of the one child policy. They're going to, they're, the, the shape of their demographic uh, graph is going to change dramatically over the next generation in a way that's detrimental to their growth. China has serious environmental issues in terms of pollution, quality of water, arable land, et cetera, that again, if they don't figure out how to address at scale and quickly, that will you know, slow down their economic engine. Um, in terms of who has greater influence, I think right now we're already seeing a bifurcation where China has already displaced the US, I think, um, as the dominant economic power uh, in most countries in the region, see China as their main, their their number one economic partner. I think the exception in that is probably for foreign direct investment, but uh, in other measures. But they, most of them, with a couple of exceptions, prefer the United States as their enduring security partner. And so, you know, they're they're trying to walk this line, and you know. Their biggest fears are either A, will force them to choose and take sides, or B, the US and China will gang up and, uh, on, and, and become a G2 that dictates terms for the world. I don't think either of those are likely, but I think it's gonna, we're gonna be in a prolonged period 
where it's a mixed picture and, and our partners and allies are gonna having to navigate a, a challenging uh, landscape each day. China seems to have a very effective policy towards Africa. Have we failed in this part of the world? I do think US policy typically neglects Africa. We don't recognize the tremendous human capital you know, potential, the, the growth rates that some of these countries are experiencing. Um, uh, and so I do think one of the questions I hope the Biden administration will wrestle with is, what is the US or the Western democracy's answer to the Belt and Road Initiative? It's not like we need to be everywhere China is. We don't need to, you know, if they build a road, we build a road. It's not a symmetrical kind of thing, but we do have to look at all of what they're doing. Are there places that are truly strategic for us that we really care about the political influence um, that is exerted in those countries uh, by China? And in those cases, what are the asymmetric methods that we can bring to bear? Maybe China, China's building a soccer state stadium and a new factory. Well, how about we come in with broadband or Wi-Fi access to open up the economy, to the digital economy, to open up the society and increase transparency of, um, in the political system? So I think that's what I, I hope we, we have developed some new tools like um, the uh, the DFC, the new uh, is a development finance corporation, I think it is, um, uh, and we should be using those tools to greater effect in terms of competing where we need to uh, to shape Africa and other parts of the world. Thank you. Uh, this will be my final question. I know we're almost at the end of the hour. How should the U.S. manage the competition among Saudi Arabia, Turkey, and Iran for hegemony in the region? And I know that's a big question for the last part of the. And manage it. <laughs> yeah. Manage it, but we certainly have to try to um, influence it for sure. Um, you know, I uh, I think I think the the biggest challenge uh, is Iran because of the revolutionary nature of the regime and their willingness to use terrorism proxies um, and all kinds of nefarious behaviors to really try to destabilize um, our partners in the region. Um, so that is, I think, the, the first problem. Um, the second, um, with regard to Saudi, is you know we have um, a, uh, a society that's going through uh, degree of transformation, um, and and the leader who's most who's almost certainly going to become the king that we will be dealing with for the coming decades, has also had his hands in the murder of a of an American resident and a journalist, Khashoggi, um, who's had his hands in a disastrous humanitarian catastrophe in Yemen and the war there, who's had his hands in some you know some ill treatment of distance and human rights violations inside his own country. So we've got a lot of work to do to try to get um, the leadership in the Saudi Arabia as if they really to understand that if they really do want to transform the country, they have got to embrace and abide by um, a higher set of international norms of behavior. Um, and then with Turkey, it's, it's the challenge of we have a, a, a really important NATO ally who is both in terms of domestic um, treatment of minorities like the Kurds, but also in terms of their regional behavior has become you know, a spoiler in many senses. And so again, a very difficult relationship there. Um, you know, I wish the US, a US president could make, you know, come up with a strategy and wave a magic wand and get all these countries moving in the right direction. But unfortunately, I think it's gonna be uh, tough sledding with all three. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Michelle. Bob, I'm going to turn this over to you, but please come out and visit us in Los Angeles when things are open up. We'd love to host you again. Thank you. Jessica, thank you very much for uh, everything you've done on behalf of our board. We appreciate that, Michelle. Thank you very much for coming back to your roots in Los Angeles County and sharing uh, this hour with us. We've learned a lot. We appreciate the contribution. 
that you have made and are continuing to make to our country. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Take care, everybody. Michelle and Bob, thank you for such a thoughtful and very important conversation. We do need to bring you back, Michelle. This was terrific. Thank you so very much.